land. And we have been interested in what are we as Parks and Open Space contributing to the county's carbon equation? Are we sequestering carbon or are we emitting more? And so we, um, it took many years for us to <laughs> figure out exactly how to tackle this project. Uh, but we finally did last year. We sent out an RFP and we got some responses and selected, competitively bid this, and selected um, the three people standing here. And they are from the Natural Resources Ecology Lab at CSU. And it is, we've got some CSU grads in there, many in our working world here. And we have Mark Easter and Amy Swan and Stephen Williams. And they, have been working with us for probably almost six months now. Uh, and they took on this challenge. It's great because they are at CSU. We are pretty much in their backyard. They have worked in other places in the West doing similar things, but it's a nice combination. They get, a nice, they get an opportunity to work with an open space agency nearby that has agriculture, forestry, um, roadsides, kind of a whole, the whole gamut. So they have done a great job kind of putting, uh, really putting the structure around a greenhouse gas inventory. And I think that you will be very impressed with all of the information that they are providing us. And we hope that this document is going to provide us with a lot of background for us to set goals on how we can start moving towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and increasing our carbon sequestration in our open space management. So with that, thank you very much for coming, and I will turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Teresa. All right, how many CSU grads are there? Oh, there's one. Oh, <laughs> what else did you do, actually? Huh? And what did you do? Nothing? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, this has been uh, really a lot of fun uh, for us to do. Um, we, we, um, at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, we, our research group does a lot of work like this at lots of different scales, at the county scale, all the way up to country scale and continental scale. And so it's, but it's been really interesting to dive in and really uh, examine land use um, in an agency like this, looking towards policy, but also seeing really what's going on on the ground. Um, it's been a great opportunity for us to explore some new questions and uh, try and answer them well, and so we've uh, we've really enjoyed the opportunity. And uh, for me personally, I've worked on the open space campaigns as a volunteer for Larimer County and the City of Fort Collins, and I never had a connection to uh, the uh, to the program here in Boulder County. So it's been uh, real nice to work with you all and have an insight into some of the work that you do. Um, so what we're going to do in this presentation is give you just a quick introduction to um, the analysis that we did, uh, the methods that we use for the inventory, and then provide some highlights for, um, for the process that we did, and then talk about what some of the options are for best management practices to meet some of your uh, land management goals. I um, want to <coughs> acknowledge uh, the people who helped us directly, and there's I, I know there's a few people on this list that, or, that we missed, and I apologize for that. Um, so, but um, I, we said at the beginning, at the opening meeting, that greenhouse gas inventories are a collaborative process. They really are, and uh, we really enjoy the collaboration with you all. And um, you all met and exceeded our expectations for data delivery and analysis, and, and uh, everything that goes into a good collaboration. Um, so just a little bit about us. Um, the Natural Resource Ecology Lab is an independent, um, soft money laboratory. It's affiliated with the Warren College of Natural Resources at CSU. We're different from the National Renewable Energy Lab. We were first, we like to say. <laughs> so although they like to argue with us about that. So um, Amy, Steve, and I are ecologists, um, employed as research associates there. And then we also worked with uh, two engineers at the Brettel Group, um, Patrick Flynn and Becky Fedak. So, um, so as we dive into this, if you can't see anything on this, um, or uh, please speak up if you just can't read something. Uh, but what I'm going to ask you to do is hold questions until the end. We've got about 20 slides. 
and then uh, and then we'll conclude with uh, with uh, uh, questions. So um, first thing, uh, we've got this uh, diagram here that was that Amy actually did for the IPCC in 2006, and uh, this represents really what it was we're trying to do. In in the Really what we are doing is we're, we're greenhouse gas accountants. We're trying to look at land management, land use, different things that we do in order to restore lands or manage lands and see what the greenhouse gas balance of those activities are. And um, we say the greenhouse gas balance because uh, I think we can arguably say every single land use or land management decision that anybody makes has a greenhouse gas consequence in some way. Do I fertilize a crop or not? How do I fertilize the crop? What type of fertilizer do I use? Am I going to manage a forest? What kind of management are we going to do? Are we going to do a prescribed burn? Are we just going to do a mechanical thinning? Are we just going to leave it alone and try and let wildfire do the work for us? All of these sorts of decisions, they have, there are greenhouse gas consequences, meaning the balance of greenhouse gas on that, on that parcel is going to be different for every single decision that you make on that. So what we're trying to account for is what the exchange of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to trees and to soil in the form of carbon and also emissions of nitrogen as nitrous oxide and emissions of carbon as CO2 and as uh, methane and carbon monoxide might be from those activities. So in this inventory, we looked at cropland, forest land, livestock, rangeland, and roadside corridors. And the greenhouse gases that we analyzed are carbon dioxide, <coughs> nitrous oxide, methane, carbon monoxide. And we tried to express everything in the common denominator of what's called a CO2 equivalent, a carbon dioxide equivalent. And so um, there's a difference between a stock value of carbon and a stock value of carbon dioxide equivalents. And we'll get into that as, as we go along here. So just uh, a few things about the methods that we use. For the spatial analysis, we use um, the excellent GIS spatial layers that were provided by uh, uh, PCPOS staff. We also combine that with the NRCS crop data layer in order to get a sense for what the uh, cropping rotations are. And also to differentiate um, different types of land cover um, on the landscape. For energy use, we used um, BCPOS data on uh, electricity, natural gas, biomass, liquid fuels use, um, and then also we combine that with, in, uh, with emission factors from the EPA eGrid database, from the climate registry, and also information provided by Excel Energy on their net, get natural gas quality. For soil carbon and nitrogen, we depended primarily upon the DASENT ecosystem model. Uh, for soil organic carbon and nitrous oxide in croplands and rangelands and also in the rangeland restoration component. And then we also use the NRCS Sergo soils database on non-agricultural lands. For livestock emissions, we focused on the IPCC uh, methods um, and those, the method we use is closely allied with and parallels the US EPA method. For biomass, we used uh, your vegetation maps combined with local, regional, and um, national default measurements of what biomass carbon stocks are in different vegetation types and alliances. And then for conservation easements, we did a separate analysis, um, and I'll show you on the map how that we differentiated that. We used a, an IPCC tier two approach to estimate what soil carbon stocks are and nitrous oxide, and biomass stocks and nitrous oxide. Uh, we also try to incorporate what we call life cycle or embodied emissions. And if you will, these are the upstream emissions. These are um, uh, the emissions associated, for example, with fuel use. The energy that's required to produce or refine and market diesel fuel and gasoline. And so, for example, for every gallon of diesel fuel that you burn in a truck or in a farm implement or whatever, it takes about a fifth of a gallon of diesel fuel equivalent in order to drill that, produce it, refine it, deliver it to market and sell it. Same thing with fertilizers. 
We looked at the energy required to manufacture and distribute nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers, and then for biomass, the energy required to cut, chip, transport biomass to your boilers. So this is a map of the, and this, I'm sure you all know this map really well. This is Boulder County, and we've broken things out into sort of three classes here for this analysis. The green parcels are agricultural lands, mostly out here on the eastern plains. The blue parcels are non-agricultural lands, and the gold parcels are conservation easements and other lands. By non-agricultural lands, we mostly mean uh, forest land, shrublands, rangeland, land that's not directly tied to agricultural production. So I'm going to jump in first here into the results uh, of, about the energy use. I'm sorry, I've got a dry throat here, so I'm going to sip from this as we go along. We broke out energy use into two different sort of two different groups. And the first one here, I don't know if you can see this, but the gold I've highlighted here, we looked at recreational travel. Based on some information that we got um, from you all, um, the assumption was that there's about a million miles of BMTs that um, people drive every year traveling to BC POS lands. Now that is, um, by VMTs we mean vehicular miles traveled. So for all the visits that people make to POS lands, it's about a million miles per year. Um, the folks at the Brettle Group broke that out and what we found was that it's about 10,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Now, that figure dwarfs everything else that's going on, so we're going to separate that out here and try to explain what is tied to directly to POS operations compared with that figure. So, um, in the last five years, um, it looks like electricity use um, grew by about 2.6% per year, and that was a pretty steady growth in 2008 to 2013. And that's the blue figures, or the blue bars in this diagram. Natural gas use, it dropped about 35% in 2010 to 2012 compared with the previous two years. That's the red in this diagram right here. So if we're going from top to bottom here in this table, we're going bottom up here in the chart. Biomass boilers, emissions are relatively low because it's a biogenic source the carbon dioxide associated with burning biomass is considered to be uh, zero, uh, carbon neutral, because it's coming from um, a, a biogenic or a plant-based source. So the emissions here are relatively small. That's the small green line here that you see in the center of this. For fleet fuel, we saw that fleet fuel emissions dropped approximately 7% per year in 2010 to 2012, this time period right here. Um, they rose from 2008 to 2009, up to peaked in 2010, and then dropped off again. And I think that's it for that slide. So, um, so now what we're going to do is talk a little bit about um, soil organic carbon and talk about the differences between stocks and emissions. One of our tasks in this project was to assess what your carbon stocks are in soils and also your carbon stocks are in uh, biomass. And so this is a map that shows what your soil organic carbon stocks are in agricultural lands. And it runs a range here from uh, relatively small, about um, up to about 25 uh, tons per hectare, up to more than 200 in some cases. And um, what, what we found here was that in parcels where you're largely just growing hay, or you have irrigated pasture, your irrigated croplands, especially those that have high clay soils, they tend to have your highest uh, soil carbon values. Now we want to differentiate the, um, stocks from actual the greenhouse gas emissions associated with these parcels. So your soil carbon stocks are the amount of carbon that's actually in the soil. Um, we're now going to look at what the um, what we call the greenhouse gas balance on these different parcels is. 
Now, going back to that diagram that Amy produced, we showed at the beginning, all of your all the land management decisions that go into managing these parcels, the irrigated cropland, the non-irrigated um, hayland, uh, pasture, these sorts of things, um, the sum total of all the management decisions that go on to it, the type of fertilizer that's used, how it's irrigated, how the fertilizer is applied, what crops are grown, what happens to the residues, all of those decisions that go into that add up to, when you put it on a balance sheet, they all add up to a greenhouse gas balance. And in most cases, what we find here on these lands is that you have a flux. You have a net flux of CO2 or greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And on average, it's a little more than one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare. Um, now that's not true on every parcel. Some of your parcels where you have really high clay soils or you're just growing continuous grass hay, these sorts of things, you're essentially carbon neutral. You're, you have no net emissions or you might have a sequestration of carbon into the soil. But on most of the lands that are managed in this way right here, 15% conventional till, about 75% reduced, about 5% no-till and 5% organic, um, we have a net emission. Now when we project that into the future, this changes. And the reason it changes is primarily tied to what we see trends in tillage of soils, management of soils, but also the county's goals to achieve 20% uh, organic uh, by 2020. And we'll explain a little bit more about why <coughs> this is different, but what we find is that the emissions drop pretty significantly. And the main two reasons for that are the use of compost and manure to replace fertilizers and also the reduction in tillage, shifting over from conventional or reduced till to no-till where you're disturbing the soil less. I'll show you a little bit about what that's about here. So this shows in some total what those values are when you look at the greenhouse gas balance in the last 10 years compared with what we project for the ne next 10. On non-irrigated and irrigated cropland, we go from, for example, irrigated cropland from this value here, it drops back pretty significantly by about uh, 2,000 metric tons per year. Um, the same thing with mixed hay when we see the replacement of synthetic fertilizers with um, uh, with uh, manure and compost, and then finally the total value here, we see a pretty significant reduction. And I um, just want to call your attention here to this stock value. It's about one and a half million tons of carbon, soil carbon, in, um, in, your, uh, your, uh, in your agricultural lands. And here's what, how the balance breaks out. On irrigated cropland, um, I'll introduce this. You're going to see a lot of slides like this to follow here. These brown bars at the bottom here are soil carbon, and they can either be above or below the zero line here. If they're below, that means you have a net sequestration of carbon in soil. And if it's above, that means you have an emission from soil to the atmosphere. The orange bars here are nitrous oxide emissions, and that's primarily from fertilizer use or nitrous, nitrogen amendments. The black is emissions, direct emissions from fuel. And then the gold is what we call these embodied emissions. So you can see the big difference here between uh, irrigated cropland and non-irrigated cropland. And we have the values here on the same scale, 6,000 at the top, minus 3,000 at the bottom here, so that Oh, I'm sorry, that's a mistake. This should be minus 4,000. But we have more land that's in irrigated cropland than we have in non-irrigated. But also the emissions are larger in it, and uh, the sequestration potential is larger in irrigated because it's more productive land. You're typically getting four to five times more production off of these lands than we do off of non-irrigated <coughs> lands. And so that's really the main difference why you see this. So I just wanted to show you what goes into this gold bar up here, these embodied or upstream emissions. And these are the emissions associated with manufacturing fertilizers, manufacturing fuel, 
uh, delivering farm products to um, for the management of crops. So in this gold bar right here, this is composed roughly half of that is from just the manufacturing of nitrogen fertilizers. It's extremely energy intensive. But what you typically see is anywhere from four to nine kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents for every kilogram of nitrogen in fertilizer that you apply. So it's pretty significant. We see a similar amount associated with phosphorus fertilizers here. And then we have a small amount here, a little bit less than 10% associated with producing, um, uh, with producing feed, or I'm sorry, with seed, with herbicides, with pesticides, and also with, uh, with uh, manufacturing fuel. So with that in mind, I want to talk real briefly about why you will see, um, why we're projecting that in the future the greenhouse gas balance is likely to improve so much. And the biggest reason is really right here. When we convert from, this is essentially business as usual right here, these two um, slides right here. Um, and what this represents is a conventional till or relatively heavy tillage, relatively heavy disturbance of soils. As you reduce the tillage, you tend to get sequestration in carb uh, in soil. And the same thing here when you convert over to no-till. As you disturb the soil less, you'll store more carbon in the soil. So that combined with shifting over from synthetic fertilizers to manure or compost we see a significant improvement in the greenhouse gas balance. You essentially shift over from a system that is a net emission of greenhouse gases to a net storing of carbon in the soil. So again, and we're going to come across this again in other places, as you reduce tillage, you reduce your emissions, and then as you shift over from synthetic manufactured fertilizers to compost and manure to replace that, you improve the greenhouse gas balance dramatically. And you also have the opportunity by converting from the traditional irrigated crops that are growing in the area here to switchgrass that could be used to produce cellulosic ethanol. Um, you also have an opportunity to improve the balance as well there. So realizing that this is um, I'm just going to pause for a second here. This is a really, this is, I know there's a lot of geek speak here, a lot of tech talk, and I'd like to ask you all, um, as, as you're seeing this and hearing what we say, um, to be thinking about, well, are there ways to express this differently that can be used in the day-to-day -day land management decisions that you all are making here on, on these lands? Um, and so if you can think about that and uh, let us know, we'd be happy to try and uh, provide that information to you. So, also wanted to show you one other opportunity that you have, and that's to convert over how some of your dry land or your non-irrigated cropping systems are managed. Most of the land is managed right now in a, what's called a fallow wheat system, where every other year you grow a wheat crop, and in the intervening years, you have nothing at all, where you're storing up soil water for the next year. And some research at CSU indicates that if you actually start growing, growing dryland corn, in this case, you really improve the greenhouse gas balance. So basically, every third year you grow wheat, every third year you grow corn, dryland corn, and every third year you have a fallow year. And then if you fertilize that with manure or compost, you improve greenhouse gas balance dramatically. Likewise, if you grow, if you just have a fallow year once every four years, and you grow wheat followed by corn and millet, you can improve it even more. So this is what we call cropping intensification. Um, that is a, a significant opportunity for your non-irrigated parcels. So I'm just putting this slide up to try and differentiate the difference between what you see, uh, the analysis we did on your conservation easements compared with 
the POS lands that you all manage directly, we weren't able to calculate what um, all of the greenhouse gas balances on those lands just because of the lack of information. But doing an assessment of the soil organic carbon stocks, you have about 1.3 million tons there, and your nitrous oxide emissions from those lands total about uh, 2,000 metric tons per year. So a couple things about rangeland. The question that came up early in the process was, well, what happens if we graze our, your, your rangelands, or what happens if we leave them ungrazed or fallow? How does that affect the greenhouse gas balance? And the bottom line is, um, it's not, there's not a big difference between that. Your rangelands are managed really well. Um, you have good vegetative cover, reasonable amount of offtake from them. And the difference between an ungrazed scenario and a grazed scenario is, real, is almost, there's almost no difference between that. Um, we were also asked to look at what the greenhouse gas balance of rangeland restoration is. And we looked at two different scenarios. The first is where you have a rangeland that's been degraded by uh, overgrazed, essentially by when you have a prairie dog colony that gets confined, it can't travel, it essentially overpopulates, and then usually dies of the plague. Um, what are the restoration opportunities there, and how does that affect the greenhouse gas balance? Um, this, let's see, I've got So if you compare the left with the right-hand side here, the greenhouse gas balance is a net positive in that degraded overgrazed condition. And whereas when you uh, restore it, it, you basically restore it to almost a neutral or a carbon zero condition. Now compare that with the situation where you have um, non-irrigated cropland that needs to be retired because it's non-productive or it's erosive or there's some other management decision that's led to that. You want to restore it to rangeland. You have this, an, uh, a net greenhouse gas flux in this non-irrigated cropland condition, but then when you restore it, to rangeland groups, you have a net, uh, a significant net improvement in the greenhouse gas balance. And the reason why for that is because soil carbon uh, stocks are relatively low, quite a bit lower in non irrigated cropland compared with rangeland. And so there's going to be a major flux of carbon, a sequestration of carbon into the soils in this process. So um, now we'll go into some of the non-irrigated land, and then we'll talk about projections in the future and, um, and uh, some recommendations. And I'm sorry, non-agricultural land. So in your non-agricultural non soil organic stocks, the soil organic carbon stocks, you have about 1.4 million metric tons of carbon CO2e in the first 30 centimeters. Biomass carbon stocks in 2003, we're about two and a half million metric tons, and somewhat less than that in 2013, and then somewhat less than that still in 2023, but not a lot of change. And the, and the difference that we see here from these is primarily due to wildfire and also some of your restoration efforts. This is a slide that shows um, essentially the average of the carbon stocks, the biomass carbon stocks at Hile Valley Ranch um, based on some models that were done by, uh, with the forest vegetation simulator. It shows carbon stock here, these two values right here, before a restoration effort. About half of the biomass vegetation is removed in this process and then slowly starts to regrow after that. So the question that came up was, what happens to this biomass after it's thinned? So we looked at it from a number of different ways and produced this analysis right here. This slide right here in the blue, you see this is the amount of biomass that's typically chipped and can be shipped either to for other purposes or go directly to your biomass boiler. Um, a portion of it right here is either piled and burned there or, uh, or could be chipped up and used in, in some other use, but doesn't go to the boiler because of quality issues. And so what we 
based on the analysis that we did, about each dry metric ton of the biomass offsets about six tenths of a ton of carbon dioxide equivalents from natural gas. So I want to point out here some, some key things here. A dry metric ton, you have to take into account what the uh, moisture content of that material might be when it's harvested and shipped and these sorts of things. But on a dry basis, this is roughly what the equivalent conversion would be for materials that are, that are uh, destined for one of your biomass boilers. So there's an offset value there. <coughs> From livestock grazing, um, the primary management uh, here is uh, cow-calf operations. And you have about 2,000 metric tons per year of um, emissions associated with that. So we looked at the difference between what a ca your cow-calf operations are, what they might be with some different livestock. So your emissions on a kilogram of live weight basis are relatively high with the, with the beef cattle, that's, and, and that's because of just the way they're ruminants, they tend to produce a lot of enteric methane. If you convert over if you convert over to other ruminants, goats or sheep, the emissions are quite a bit lower, about one third lower. And then if you graze only horses, excuse me, it would be less than half of what the emissions are associated with livestock or with uh, cow calf operations. So um, I'm going to close with some projections and then recommendations for uh, potential best management practices. Um, uh, energy use, we see that non-recreational visits uh, to, or excluding non-recreational visits to uh, POS lands, there appears to be um, a, an overall trend downward at about 2% per year. Um, with croplands, we're likely going to see a drop of about 6% per year, and that's primarily due to shifting over to organic agriculture and decreasing tillage on these lands. Um, in forest and uh, shrublands, the likelihood of wildfire creates a lot of uncertainty in any analysis that we could do. And so I, we really don't feel like we can make a projection about what your greenhouse gas balance on these lands for, for uh, biomass is going to be into the future. Um, for rangelands and livestock, your range, rangelands appear to be well managed. The greenhouse gas balance is likely to remain pretty consistent not going to change a whole lot. Market trends seem to be supporting continued beef production in this area, so it seems like emissions are likely to remain constant unless there's a shift from grazing cattle over to some other, uh, some other species. So um, options for best management practices in energy use, I will thank the Brendel Group for this, they're recommending that you replace diesel fuel with biodiesel, that you utilize biomass from the forests um, uh, to the extent possible to burn in your boilers and that you continue to practice conservation measures in your buildings <coughs> and your vehicles. And croplands, the recommendation is to replace synthetic fertilizers with manure and compost. And when using synthetic and fertilizers, you use slow release products and nitrification inhibitors that are just starting to come on the market right now. Um, you also, as you apply fertilizers and manure or compost, that you bury or inject it at the time of application. That you reduce tillage. When uh, the market presents an opportunity for it, you start to grow switchgrass to produce ethanol. And then finally, uh, cropping intensification on non-irrigated cropland, adding in the dryland corn and the dryland millet into the fallow wheat systems. In rangelands, uh, we can't really recommend a change in your <coughs> range management. I don't think there's a way to improve it. Uh, with livestock, there may be an opportunity to start feeding what's called ionophores and other types of feed supplements that will reduce enteric methane emissions. But that's something that's difficult to do with pasture or range-fed cattle. So it may not be a viable <coughs> operation at this time, but it, it can potentially uh, reduce your emissions significantly. With your forest and shrublands, the recommendation is to continue the forest restoration work 
where it's practical. And then we haven't really discussed roadside corridors, but the one recommendation that we can make there is where you have the opportunity to manage unmowed parts of the corridors for shrubs, uh, where it doesn't pre present a safety or visibility issue, that you actually do that. Um, and I think that's it. Um, I think we've got time for questions, and thank you all very much. We really appreciate the opportunity to do this work with you. So we just, at work, we call this a core dump. We've just dumped a whole load of data, a lot of information, but we'd happy happy to talk about any questions that come up. And in particular, we, this question we have for you, how can we make this analysis um, the most meaningful in the context of the land use decisions that you all have to make on a day-to-day -day basis? I have a quick geeky question. What's the origin of that day set model that you use? That's a great question. Um, it goes back to the, the first work on it was done um, about 1981. No, no, it was developed at, uh, at NREL, where we work, and, and it was first called the Century Model, and then it's been improved. Um, the first version of the Descent Model came out in 1997, but it's based on that work that started in 1981. It was originally programmed in punch cards, if you can imagine that. Any punch card programmers here? Sorry. Steve and me. Because you told us it's like 1.3 million metric tons for is basically our carbon stock on our ag properties mm -hmm. on our ag land. What is it on our forest land? It's it's about the same. It's a little more than that. And so um, something to keep in mind here is that there's actually quite a bit more soil carbon all the way down. If you go down to say all the way through the rooting zone down to two meters or more, that's typically not measured. What's the, the parts that are measured are like the first foot or so, first eight inches to a foot, because that's where most of the soil carbon is, and it change, that's the stuff, that's the soil carbon that's going to change, most likely, as you start growing crops, as you manage forests, you know, these sorts of things. So, yeah, but it's roughly about 1.3 to 1.5 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents in that top eight inches to a foot. And does it go deeper in ag land versus forest land, or is it pretty much the same? Your soil carbon stocks below that yeah. Um You know, down in the ag land here, it's probably going to be deeper because most of that land was was grassland, and um, it's it's better soil for growing crops. Um, and I I couldn't say this across the board, but most of the forest land soils that you have are going to be shallower. They're going to be rockier. Um, there's just, and the soils tend to be less productive than these ag land soils. Um, and so you're probably going to have too depth, you know, all the way down through the rooting zone. You're probably going to have less carbon in those soils compared with the ag land soils. So big, broad picture is in the forested areas, more of the carbon is stored in the trees above ground and in the rangelands, certainly, mm -hmm. it's stored below ground. Um, and the cropland is in flux. That's a, um, I'd, I'd nuance that a little bit differently. Um, pretty much one of the rules of ecosystems that we find when we look at carbon pools is that there's nearly always more soil carbon um, than there is biomass carbon. Now there's some exceptions here like in the redwoods and in you know, giant eucalyptus forests in Australia and a few other ecosystems. But generally across the board, and especially in grasslands, you tend to have more, um, more soil carbon than you do biomass carbon. Um, but um, you can generalize that also to say that your, your agricultural soils are going to have probably quite a bit more carbon than your forest land soils are going to um, because of mostly because of landscape position. You know, they're not on steep, rocky, erodible slopes. Um, you're not tending to grow wheat in those sorts of areas.
I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Therese. Is that, that Yeah, yeah, that answers it. Uh, I'm just thinking for, from our management perspective, the presentation really leads me to believe that we have far more um, ability to manage carbon in our agricultural land than we do in our forest land. And the slide you showed of our forest thinning, how the, how the carbon stocks dropped, and then, I mean, it didn't even regain in 10 years from now. You know, looking at the models that, um, that Nick provided to us, it seems like they're accumulating in these ponderosa pine forests and woodlands, they're accumulating at about, it's about three and a half metric tons of CO2 equivalents, or about a ton of carbon per year in these forests. So it's, it's pretty slow. It take, um, these forests typically have about, at, at the stocking levels that they have right now, about 150 metric tons of CO2 equivalents. And if you drop them back down to 70 um, through a restoration activity, you're talking 20 to 30 years before they'll achieve or eventually get back, maybe even longer, before they'll get back to um, the levels that they're at right now. Um, the, really the question is, is the level that we see right now in those, that biomass carbon, is that um, what you typically would see in a forest or in an ecosystem where, you know, wildfire processes are allowed to, you know, well, at the rate at which they historically ran in those forests. They, I think most people would argue they were probably lower. Yeah, Jeff. So, um, per pound or per ton, does pine tree have more carbon in it or a corn plant? Ah, great question. Because we could change our boilers to burn crop refuse as opposed to pine trees. Mm. I'm going to turn to Amy and Steve on this. <laughs> So how much, on the irrigated corn land here, we get maybe, what, eight tons of production in a year? Sounds about right. Yeah. So, on just the residue, you mean, or is that the residue? Yeah, including grains. Including grain? Yeah, probably eight to ten. Yeah. So, grain is Same. probably about... About the same. Yeah. So, so you get about eight, ten, eight tons oh. of corn production for uh, of corn on irrigated cropland in a year um, and on a hectare compared with about if you are going through a thinning operation in ponderosa pine there's about um, 50 to 70 tons of biomass that's available for well we've got a difference here between carbon and biomass that we've got to be careful yeah, about yeah yeah and, and and you know pr from a practical standpoint, there's also a lot of differences in like density, you know, so the amount of carbon per, you know, volume, I guess, of material. And so like hauling all that, which is one of the key issues with cellulosic um, biofuels in general, but especially something light like corn residues where you have to pack them in bales and even then it's not nearly as dense as wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. It's, it's a good question, and um, I guess the, I think the answer would be, in the end, it depends whether the greenhouse gas balance is better to grow corn for your boilers or to grow biomass. You know, there's a lot of other value-based decisions that come in, the extent to which you want to manage um, open space lands, the extent to, you know, what sort of lands are appropriate to come in and try and thin, whereas those where you can't, um, compared with, um, you know, what's the appropriate use of farmland um, for growing food versus um, fuel, those sorts of things. So there's, it ends up getting to be, you know, the answer, I think, is it ends up being pretty complicated. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I don't know, I'll of boiler and boilers. Uh, have you looked at biochar? So the question is to convert biomass into biochar and then apply it to fields, will that improve the greenhouse gas balance? It's a really good question. And um, 
I'm, I'm going to say the answer depends um, on how you produce the biochar and what it's produced from, whether it's produced from wood, from the forest, or from crop residues. Um, if you um, it, you have the potential with biochar to actually improve the greenhouse gas balance a lot. Um, however, one thing to keep in mind is if you're using crop residues to do that, you may be doing it at the expense of soil carbon that those crop residues might have actually decomposed and been retained as more carbon in the soil. Um, there's other issues to take into account. Um, we just heard a presentation by a biochar expert um, who was beating the table telling us you can't just use the generic term biochar, not all biochar is created equal. And as it turns out, biochar that's produced from pine trees um, actually can have a really detrimental yeah. effect on it. It actually can really reduce crop production. Um, and it has something to do with the salt exchange and the cation exchange balance in the soils nobody really knows. Um, compared with biochar that's made from wheat stalks or barley stalks or other sorts of sources, maybe corn stalks. It also depends on how the biochar is made. So um, it, there's not a really clear answer on that. Um, but I think um, what, what he was also saying was that he expects in the next five to seven years that a clear answer is going to emerge about this, what the potential benefits are. And, um, and it has great potential to, because uh, you can also produce liquid fuels from it, um, from the materials coming off of it and as biochar is manufactured. Yeah, and there's, there's quite, there is some research in our um, department on biochar application. I think Francesca's researching. She was finding that you need pretty large quantities in, um, in our kind of front range systems to show much difference. I can't remember what the tonnage was, but it was like five tons per which is quite a lot. Yeah. So there's also kind of the issue of how much you would need for it to be worth the expense and to improve crop yields. But don't you want to just combine it with compost? Yeah, he, he talked about that as an interesting option. Um, yeah, and there's, there's some good opportunities there, but um, you have to be careful with it. Um, there's pH issues yeah. and salt issues and all of that that in the end you, you really have to look at biochar with well what are you wanting to just store the carbon or are you wanting to improve you know crop production at the same time in the end the, the best answer may be to just produce compost with it with the, the, the material and apply that to soils about the integration of durable wood products more into our forestry program you know, with biomass and fuel we burn it and that factors in the greenhouse equation but yeah. when you turn it into fence rails or yeah. trail trail heads or lumber yeah. it has a much life, longer useful life so how would that affect what we that's a that's a really great question um, and I'm trying to think of what the, the way IPCC treats durable materials, they assume it has a basically a hundred year life before it decomposes into CO2 to go into the atmosphere. So you're essentially delaying the return into the atmosphere by hundred years. So um, with ponderosa pine, for sure, there's some opportunities there. With lodgepole pine, there's limits on, it sounds like you probably know, there's limits on how, what sort of products you can use it for. Um, with spruce and fir, maybe some other options there as well too. So, but yeah, it's definitely something to explore. Is there a mill here in Boulder County that could? That oh, could there's, do that? there's there's some mills around. Yeah, it's just okay. something we really have because it's uh, not really written on our management plans for our properties or any principal these forest products. But mm -hmm. when it comes to storing carbon, turning it into something that's going to last for a long time. Right. So. There's there's an opportunity there from a greenhouse gas balance perspective to. To, to improve things here. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. How much do the models for the soil carbon take into consideration all the fungal associates that are in that soil? Because it seems like the prairie soil roots and associates are going to go up to 14 feet deep. 
Yeah. So if you're only measuring one foot, right. it seems like you're missing potentially fast quantities. That's a great question. And that's, uh, you're exactly right. And in fact, we see the same thing in forest soils too. The fungal, the microbe community is extremely important. Um, the microbe community is still present and extremely active in that top, um, that top foot, you know, eight inches to a foot. Um, and the reason we focus on that um, top layer of soil is because that's where, um, what it's about, 50 to 60 percent of the total soil carbon that you find in the profile is found. And it's also the most subject to change. And the soil, the carbon in the soil below that um, tends to, um, if it changes as a result of plowing or clearing or changing land use, um, it changes much more slowly. And in fact, in, in a lot of cases, you can't even detect a change with it. So we'd expect what's going on with the microbes there would be remain relatively constant. It's in this top profile where we see that's where the most vulnerable carbon is. And um, uh, Keith Boston, who directs our lab, says, says the main axiom of, of ecosystem management is to try and keep carbon in the ground, whatever that, or keep it in the vegetation, try and keep it out of the atmosphere. Because once it, is, once it escapes, it's really hard to get it back into the ecosystems and stabilize it there. Does, does that answer your question? So do you account for what's below with just a model of what you expect to be there and so that gets factored in? It does get factored in, yeah. And that feeds into the plant growth equations. But um, when we're doing greenhouse gas inventories, we're mostly focused on how carbon is changing. And so the stable pools, we take into account how they contribute to plant growth and um, ecosystem cycling. But if the pool is not changing, um, we tend to not focus on it. If it's not taking up carbon or losing carbon to the atmosphere, you know, what we're really interested in is that greenhouse gas balance. That's the most important thing right now. The stocks are important. It's interesting to know, and especially from the standpoint of avoided emissions, it's important to know what those stocks are. But really, where the rubber meets the road is where carbon is either leaving the ecosystem into the atmosphere or coming back into soils and biomass. That's why we focus on that top layer. It would just be interesting to take prairie that has never been used for agricultural purposes and assess its soil carbon capacity um, relative to how well you're able to manage it. Are you able to do prescribed burns or not? And how is that how is that capacity changing in what we would call a native prairie land, for example? Because that seems like it would be just interesting and valuable for management. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And we can, if you give me your contact info afterwards, we can send you some papers on that. So I'd be happy to um, talk with you more. Yeah. Did your model incorporate uh, increased um, growing season in this region with increased with climate change? Climate. <laughs> um, for this analysis, no. And that this is something we've done in a lot of other analyses, but not for this one. Um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in 10 years. <coughs> 20, 30, 40 years out, um, it's a lot easier to predict what's going to happen. The, the best that we can say is it's, it's probably going to change right now. I mean, we've, we've used actual weather yeah. the entire, well, how far back does our weather data go? Well, our actual weather. I think the, the part of the study that we were most concerned with, we, we used the, the, the recent 10 years worth of actual data, actual right. weather, uh, and for the projection, we reused that 10 years. So that it was on an equal playing field in terms of time. Right. But yeah, we, so, but we are capturing, you know, the changes over the last, how many years, probably? It, I think it goes back to 1979. Yeah, certainly. But that's an interesting question. There's a lot of people who are looking at that. Um, we just completed an analysis, and um, well, it's in, in, I say we, it's people at the lab have just pre done an analysis for the Great Plains, and it's um, it's uh, as the climate warms, we're likely going to see you know a lot more demand for water from plants, 
longer growing season, but that doesn't necessarily translate into more production. And so, um, but the best we can say is in, in this area that things are likely to change. We just don't know in what direction at this point. On a similar note, did you look at nitrogen, increased nitrogen deposition? That is broken out in, or that is included in the model, but that's a really good point. Um, as we get more people here, we're going to get more nitrogen dumped into the soils. Compared, though, with the amount of nitrogen that gets applied on a typical farm field for fertilizer, <coughs> about um, between 10 and 20 times more gets applied as fertilizer, and that has a bigger impact on um, nitrous oxide emissions than. Um, than the, the background emissions, but it's still a really important, uh, a really important component. Uh, tag it on to Jim's question. Great question, Jim, because I was thinking of the other side of that. <coughs> Model incorporating climate change, but from a decomposition standpoint, <coughs> as we're getting warmer yeah. and stuff breaks down faster. Yeah. Uh, That's a good question. It won't be linear to uh, growing stuff. The, pre the predictions that we're seeing for the Rocky Mountains for this area are that the climate is likely to warm um, and precipitation is likely about to remain about the same. Um, but the precipitation will come in more intense, it'll, we'll get more of it in less frequent um, precipitation events. So it'll remain about the same over the course of a year, but we'll, we'll have fewer, more intense storms. So the big question, and I know a number of people are asking about this, is with a warmer climate, um, same amount of water, but it all comes at once, basically. Or does that mean there's going to be more moisture in the soil or less? More moisture in, in the plant matter that's vulnerable to decomposition or not? Uh, people are starting to look at that right now, and, and the, jury's, uh, the jury's still out on it. Wish we had a good answer on that. else? Well, um, we'd, we'd love to hear from you guys and um, Therese has our um, contact info and I'm sorry I didn't put that up here, uh, but again, um, interpreting this data in ways that's really meaningful for land management. And we're really interested in hearing from you all what your questions might be about that and um, do whatever we can to make this the most meaningful uh, that we can for you all. Thank you again. It's really been a, a real pleasure to work with you all on this project.